Before we dive into today's video, I've got something important to share with you, and that is our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace. You know, in this digital age, having a killer website is important, and that's where Squarespace comes in. It's the all-in-one website platform that's got everything you need to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're a creative genius, a small business owner, or just someone with a passion to share, Squarespace has you covered. You can start with a gorgeous template and customize every inch with their fluid engine. It's sort of like having a magic wand. You just tap, and there's a website. And now there's a new feature, Squarespace Courses. With Squarespace Courses, you can create and sell your own online course easily. Start with a professional layout that fits your brand, upload videos, and customize your course with a powerful Fluid Engine editor. Create engaging lessons your audience will love, then simply add a paywall and set the price. You can charge a one-time fee or sell subscriptions. Take what you know and turn it into an income with Squarespace courses. Plus, there are Squarespace email campaigns. It's a fantastic way to drive sales and engage with your audience. You can easily collect email subscribers right on your site and then send out regular updates. Whether it's welcoming new subscribers, announcing an upcoming sale, or sharing discount codes with your top customers, Customers, Squarespace email campaigns have you covered. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website or start selling courses, go to squarespace.com slash brain food to save a whopping 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring, and now today's video. Imagine for a moment that you've come across someone lying unconscious on the ground. They aren't breathing and they have no pulse. Do you know what to do? If you're taking a first aid course, then you probably know the following steps by heart. Call 911 or ask a bystander to do so for you. Place the victim on their back on a firm surface. Kneel next to the victim's neck and shoulders. Place the heel of one hand on their chest between the nipples and the other hand on top of the first. With your elbows locked and using your body weight, compress the victim's chest at least two inches or five centimeters at 100 to 120 compressions per minute, roughly the same as the rhythm of staying alive or another one bites the dust. Don't worry if you hear a crunch, broken ribs are better than death. After 30 chest compressions, perform rescue breathing. Tilt the victim's head back with one hand while lifting their chin with the other to open the airway. Pinch the victim's nose shut, place your lips over theirs to form a seal and breathe out, watching the victim's chest to make sure it rises. If you have a protective rescue breathing barrier or mask, use it. If the victim's mouth is too badly injured to form a seal, breathe through their nose. Deliver two rescue breaths, then resume chest compressions. Continue alternating between 30 compressions and two breaths until medical help arrives. If you're too tired to continue, ask someone else to take over. While there is significant research indicating that for non-emergency responders without any of the tools these individuals have, it's actually much better to just do compressions, for reasons we'll get into in the bonus facts later. For now, these are the official American Heart Association instructions for cardiopulmonary resuscitation, better known as CPR, a procedure that helps save the lives of an estimated 100,000 people every year. But while CPR might seem like a straightforward and intuitive process that has been around forever, in reality its modern form only dates to the 1960s. Prior to this, doctors promoted all sorts of elaborate questionable and downright bizarre techniques for reviving victims of drowning, suffocation, cardiac arrest, and other medical emergencies, including quite literally blowing smoke up people's bottoms. So take a deep breath and tone up your arms as we dive into the long and convoluted history of CPR. Surprisingly, modern resuscitation techniques have existed since the dawn of human civilization. The ancient Hindu Rig Veda and ancient Egyptian Ebers Papyrus, both written in the second millennium BCE, describe the process of tracheostomy, in which an incision is made in the throat and a hollow reed is inserted to bypass a blocked airway. An early form of rescue breathing is also apparently performed by the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament. Gehazi oh, went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room, and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Descriptions of rescue breathing combined with chest compressions appear in ancient Greece, ancient Roman, and medieval European and Middle Eastern medical texts, with one of the most advanced techniques, which involved moving the victim's arms to expand the lungs and compressing the left side of their chest, being developed by 15th century Persian physician Burhan ud Din Kamani. However, none of these techniques were widely endorsed by mainstream physicians and were mostly used by lay healers and midwives. The following centuries, however, saw an explosion of weird and wonderful techniques for reviving victims of drowning, 
causing suffocation and hypothermia. With little understanding of how respiration or even blood circulation work, doctors instead focused on shocking unconscious bodies back to life. This was accomplished by flagellating victims with whips, wet cloths, or even stinging nettles, pouring hot water, embers, or burning dry excrement on their bodies, hanging them upside down, or placing them on the back of a trotting horse, bloodletting, and even, as previously alluded to, tobacco smoke enemas, which unfortunately is exactly what it sounds like. Indeed, by the 1780s, the British Society for the Recovery of Persons Apparently Drowns, later the Royal Humane Society, installed resuscitation kits containing tobacco enema equipment at various points along the River Thames to revive victims of drowning, and for more on this absurd practice, please do check out our previous video when the doctors literally blew smoke up your ass. Thankfully for all of us today, starting in the 16th century, doctors began to better understand how the body works, laying the groundwork for future, more successful resuscitation methods. Contemporary techniques, however, remained as questionable as ever. For example, in the 1530s, Swiss physician Theophrastus Con Hohenheim, better known as Paracelsus, advocated the bellows method, which involved inserting an ordinary fireplace bellows into a victim's nostril and using it to pump air into their lungs. This not only did little to revive the victim, but could actually inflict further damage by overinflating the lungs and filling them with ash and cinders. It's worth noting here that in Paracelsus's time, doctors believed that it was merely the motion of the lungs which kept people alive. It was not until 1667 that English polymath Robert Hooke postulated that it was actually the continuous supply of fresh air that was vital to life, a fact he demonstrated by cutting open a dog and keeping it alive by pumping air in and out of its lungs. Six decades later, in 1732, a Scottish surgeon named William Tossach successfully used mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breathing to revive a suffocated coal miner. Not only was this the first recorded use of this technique in the modern medical literature, but it also practically demonstrated that exhaled breath contains enough oxygen to support life. Indeed, we now know that while ordinary air at sea level contains around 21% oxygen, not all of this is absorbed by the lungs, meaning that exhaled breath contains around 13% oxygen, along with 78% nitrogen and 9% carbon dioxide and other trace gases. Shortly after Tossard's discovery, the French Academy of Sciences in Paris made mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation its official recommended technique for reviving drowning victims. However, in a move likely inspired by Anglo-French rivalry rather than sound scientific judgment, the Royal Humane Society rejected this recommendation and instead promoted the use of bellows, which, along with tobacco smoke, enema gear, were included in resuscitation kits installed along the Thames. The accidental inflation of the stomach by the bellows was at first prevented by applying pressure to the esophagus, while in 1788, physician Charles Kite developed the procedure of endotracheal intubation, the insertion of a tube directly into the trachea. This technique is still used today. Meanwhile, doctors and inventors across the British Isles introduced a variety of alternative resuscitation techniques, including the inversion method, which involved hanging the victim upside down from a block and tackle and repeatedly raising and lowering them, and the barrel method, in which the victim was draped over a barrel and rolled back and forth. While seemingly as absurd as earlier techniques like flagellation or the trotting horse, they worked on the sound principle of expanding and compressing the chest to expel water and stimulate breathing. The next major move toward the standardization of resuscitation techniques came in August 1767, with the establishment of the Society and Recovery of Drowned Persons in Amsterdam, a city of canals and cold winters that suffered hundreds of cases of drowning and hypothermia every year. In its first year of operation, the Society saved 150 people, inspiring the formation of similar organizations in Hamburg, Venice, Milan, Padua, Vienna, Paris, and other cities. In Hamburg in 1769, an ordinance was passed allowing notices to be read in churches describing standard techniques for resuscitating people who were drowned, strangled, suffocated, and frozen. Among these techniques was artificial respiration, which proved so effective that in a stunning reversal of opinion, it soon prompted the British Royal Humane Society to declare its long-preferred revival instrument, the bellows, quote, a lethal weapon which should be relegated to its former place by the fireside. By the 1820s, however, the society had again abandoned artificial respiration, this time in favor of chest compressions. Their logic was that artificial respiration risked overinflating the victim's lungs, while the fresh air inspired via chest compressions was superior to expired air, which was depleted of oxygen. In 1868, Dr. John Hill of the Royal Free Hospital in London described a widely used method nearly identical to today's CPR techniques. The surgeon's left hand was placed firmly across the front of the chest, the fingers resting over the fifth, sixth, and seventh costal cartilages on the right side, while the tip of the thumb lay on the second piece of the sternum and the muscular part of the hand on the corresponding cartilages on the left side. The right hand was now crossed over the left, and forcible pressure made, the hands then being suddenly removed, the chest was allowed to expand by its own elasticity. 
Soon, however, other doctors developed a host of alternative methods for achieving the same ventilation effect. The technique developed by London physician Marshall Hall in 1856, for example, involved alternately repositioning the victim from face up to their side, while that developed by Henry Sylvester in 1858 involved alternately stretching the patient's arm over their head and crossing them over their chest to expand and compress the lungs. Yet another technique, the Dalrymple method, involved passing a cloth beneath the victim, crossing it over their chest, and having two people pull alternately on each end. Of these, the Sylvester method proved surprisingly long-lived, with a refined version known as the Holger Nielsen method being used well into the 1950s. Now, so far, we have only looked at one half of the CPR equation, getting fresh air into the victim's lungs and bloodstream. The other goal of the CPR practitioner is to manually pump the victim's heart in order to circulate that absorbed oxygen to vital areas of the body, particularly the brain. The development of such techniques depended on scientists and doctors gaining an accurate understanding of how the heart and blood circulation work an understanding first pioneered by English physician William Harvey. In 1628, Harvey published the landmark volume An Anatomical Exercise on the Motion of the Heart and Blood in Living Beings, in which he described for the first time how blood flows from the heart through arteries to every corner of the body before being returned to the heart via the veins. In that same year, he described the following experiment conducted on a dissected dove. Quote, after the heart had quite left motion, and the ears, arterial appendages, had quite given over, I wetted my finger with spittle, and being warmed, kept it a while on the heart. The heart and its ears began to contract, and did seem as if it were recalled back again from death." End quote. This remarkable result suggested that a stopped heart could be restarted by manual manipulation, what is now known by surgeons as cardiac massage. However, it would not be until the 1870s, after the development of general anesthesia and sterile surgical methods, that cardiac massage would successfully be used in surgery. In 1874, Moritz Schiff, a professor of physiology working in Florence, Italy, was studying the causes of cardiac arrest in surgical patients and ethicized with chloroform and ether using dogs as test subjects. Noting that in these cases, cardiac arrest usually preceded respiratory arrest, Moritz realized that the regular resuscitation methods of artificial ventilation or chest compressions would be useless. Instead, he discovered that, quote, if one opens the thorax whilst air is slowly blown into the lungs and compresses the heart rhythmically with the hand to squeeze out the blood, compressing the abdominal aorta at the same time so that more of the artificial circulation is directed to the head, one can restore the heart as long as 11 and a half minutes after it has been arrested, end quote. At a stroke, Schiff had demonstrated that cardiac massage worked not only through directly stimulating the heart, but also by restoring the flow of oxygenated blood to the cardiac muscle, allowing it to resume its regular function. Three decades later, in 1901, Norwegian surgeon Dr. Christian Ilgesrud was performing an abdominal surgery when his patient's heart suddenly stopped. Working quickly, Ilgesrud cut away part of the patient's fourth and fifth ribs, reached into the thoracic cavity, and massaged the heart until it restarted. The patient went on to make a complete recovery. By 1909, nearly 50 successful uses of internal cardiac massage had been reported, while by 1952 a successful rate of nearly 33% had been achieved, earning the practice of place in the pantheon of standard surgical techniques. Even if the patient's chest was not already open, cardiac massage could be carried out without cutting any ribs away by making an incision in the abdomen and reaching up below the rib cage into the thoracic cavity. At the same time, surgeons were beginning to discover that external chest compressions could be just as effective at maintaining circulation and restoring cardiac function as invasive cardiac massage. In 1878, for example, German surgeon Dr. Rudolf Baum successfully used this technique to maintain blood circulation in cats, while in 1891 and 1903, fellow German Dr. Friedrich Maas and American surgeon Dr. George Creel reported the first successful resuscitations of patients via external chest compressions. However, these findings were largely ignored, with internal heart massage remaining the preferred technique until the 1960s. While this failure to adopt the newer, less invasive technique was partially due to poor communication between cardiac experts, it was also a product of professional propriety, with surgeons fearing that external chest compressions, which could theoretically be performed by anyone, would undermine their own medical value. To combat the first obstacle, in 1924, six cardiologists met in Chicago to form the American Heart Organization, an organization dedicated to collecting and disseminating new research on cardiac health through conferences and its official journal Circulation, which was first published in 1950. This period also saw significant progress in the development of emergency resuscitation techniques that could be performed by the average citizen. By 1946, Minnesota physician James Ellen performed artificial respiration on a child afflicted with polio, which in extreme cases paralyzes the diaphragm and leads to respiratory arrest. As Ellen later recalled, I sealed my lips around his nose and his lungs inflated. In four breaths, 
he was pink. Ten years later, Austrian physicist Peter Safar built upon Ellum's methods, perfecting a technique which came to be known as rescue breathing. In 1957, rescue breathing was officially adopted by the US Army to resuscitate victims of cardiac arrest and other medical emergencies. CPR, as we know it today, however, was the brainchild of American electrical engineer and medical researcher William Carwin Holven, who also invented another key piece of resuscitation technology, the defibrillator. As previously covered in our video, Hollywood Myths, How Doctors Actually Resuscitate Someone, Cohenhoven joined the staff of Johns Hopkins University of Baltimore in 1914 and in 1928 began studying the use of electricity to reset hearts afflicted by fibrillation, random, uncoordinated contraction that prevents blood from being effectively pumped. In the course of this research, he discovered that adequate circulation could be maintained in even a fibrillating heart for up to 30 minutes through the application of external chest compressions. In 1960, at a meeting of the Maryland Medical Society, Cohenhoven announced that he had achieved a survival rate of 70% in 20 patients, demonstrating that the average citizen could effectively respond to a cardiac emergency outside a hospital environment without the need for special medical equipment. Peter Zavar, who was also at the conference, combined Cohenhoven's methods with his own rescue breathing technique to create modern cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. That same year, Zafar Elam, Dr. Arch Gordon, and Norwegian toy maker Asmund Laerdal created Resusiani. This was a life-size training mannequin still used today to teach basic CPR skills to millions of people worldwide. In 1962, Safar, along with doctors Guy Knickerbocker and James Jude, embarked on a global tour to promote the new technique, even producing a training film titled The Pulse of Life, which introduced the now familiar mnemonic ABC for the key components of CPR – airway, breathing, and circulation. In 1963, the American Heart Association officially endorsed CPR, while in 1966, a national conference was created to officially standardize the technique. But while CPR is now taught in first aid courses all around the world, it is important to point out out that it is not the magical resuscitation technique depicted in many movies and TV shows in which a handful of breaths and chest compressions are all it takes to immediately bring a victim back to life. Rather, the main purpose of CPR is to maintain blood and oxygen flow to a victim's brain, thus preventing permanent damage until they can receive proper medical attention. If performed promptly and correctly, CPR can double or even triple a heart attack or cardiac arrest patient's chances of survival. However, even these improved odds are disturbingly low. According to a 2010 meta-study, the average survival rate for out-of-hospital cardiac arrests without immediate intervention is only 7.6%, while the rate for in-hospital arrests is only slightly better at 17%, and these statistics only apply to younger, healthier patients. The odds drop to 6.7% for patients in their 70s and 2.4% for those over 90, while the long-term survival rate after resuscitation for those with cancer or heart, lung, and liver disease is an abysmal 2%. Still, a slim chance is better than no chance at all, so if you haven't already, maybe go out and get your CPR certification. It may just save someone's life. Bonus fact. In 2010, ILCOR, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, reviewed hundreds of studies and found that breathing just wasn't necessary for people when doing CPR, even for advanced medical personnel like paramedics and doctors. They also found checking for a pulse wasn't as important as once thought. Instead, the layperson just needed to know two things in the circumstances. Is the person unconscious and are they breathing normally? If not, start CPR. All a person needs to know in this case is how to perform compressions. The extreme shift from a layperson not needing to necessarily give breaths and not checking for pulses might on the surface seem strange. After all, brain cells obviously need oxygen to maintain aerobic metabolism, so why not breathe for them? What Ilkor found was that at the moment someone goes into cardiac arrest, the brain is still trying to function, only with a less than adequate oxygen supply. The breathing centers of the brain, specifically the medulla oblongata and the pons region, continue to send signals to the diaphragm in an attempt to keep respiration going. The end result is a breathing rate known as agonal respiration. While this type of breathing isn't sufficient to maintain appropriate oxygen levels in someone's blood for long, it still allows for some exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide within the lungs. At the moment of cardiac arrest, there is also an adequate amount of oxygen in the blood to maintain metabolism within the brain for a few minutes. A person's metabolism will naturally use up this available oxygen over time, but combined with agonal respiration, the result is that there can be enough oxygen within the bloodstream that breathing isn't necessary. Unfortunately, the exact amount of time where breathing isn't necessary isn't precisely known, varying from study to study. However, Ilkor looked at studies using different ventilation to compression ratios from 15 compressions to two breaths, all the way up to 100 compressions to one breath, and even no breathing and only compressions. While every study had differing numbers of survival, the trend was always the same. The least amount of interruption in compressions, even for breathing, the better chance the person had of surviving. 